Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the trending topics section of Masterminds Masterclasses 2.0, organized by the Council of Hong Kong Laureate Forum, the HKLF. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Tasha Cheng, and it's my great pleasure to be your MC today. On behalf of HKLF, a very warm welcome to each and every one of you joining us here in person today. And I'd like to extend our heartiest welcome to our online guests who are joining us from all around the world. Thank you for joining us. And climate change, we have themed this trending topic as climate emergency. And climate emergency is not the matter of a single subject, but instead it is a cross-disciplinary subject that involves different parties and contributions from different scientific research in different fields and disciplines. In this section, we're very honored to have scientists in mathematics, life science, and environmental science to give us some ideas of their research regarding today's topic. They will cover climate analysis, causes finding, impact prediction, and solution design. With that, it would definitely be a very thought-provoking section. Please be reminded that there will be a Q&A panel discussion after the presentations of our distinguished speakers. We welcome questions from both our online audience as well as our live audience. And for our friends joining us online, feel free to submit your questions through the Q&A platform uh, and the function on the webinar. And we will address some to answer. And to kick off our discussion on climate emergency, we're very honored to have Mr. Shun Chi Ming to be our keynote speaker to deliver a keynote speech, an opening speech. Mr. Shun is the chair of the Hong Kong Meteorological Society, fellow of the Royal Meteorological Society, member of the Executive Committee of the Chinese Meteorological Society, and member of the American Meteorological Society. He served as the former director of Hong Kong Observatory and former president of the Commission for Aeronautical Meteorology, CAEM of the UN World Meteorological Organization, the WMO. Wow, we've got such a heavyweight speaker here. And ladies and gentlemen, please join me to welcome Mr. Shun. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Tong and uh, Secretary General uh, for inviting me here. And uh, our young scientists, uh, both here and online. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about climate change. And of course, uh, it is a burning issue. That's why I uh, call it the climate emergency. Um, today's talk uh, will be basically uh, what we know from science. And from about science, we have to listen to the, the uh, international body on this uh, uh, topic. And it is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And every few years, uh, uh, they provide updates, uh, scientific assessment of climate change. And right now, we're already in the sixth cycle. And uh, if you're interested in this topic, please uh, go to the website and check out uh, this uh, scientific report, which was uh, published in um, 2021. And by the way, uh, IPCC, because of its scientific achievement, uh, obtained the Nobel Prize uh, in 2007, together with Al Gore. And uh, right now, I think uh, it's really, really the hottest topic of the day, because um, the uh, climate conference, COP27, is ongoing in Egypt as we speak. We don't re actually know the outcome right now, as uh, I think it is going to end uh, uh, next week. But uh, if we listen to what our Secretary General from the UN, um, he, what he said is really worrying because uh, we are actually heading towards not just an emergency, but towards the climate hell, as he put it. So you can all appreciate uh, the situation right now. I'm, I will talk about uh, this situation later, but um, global warming, just some basic um, fact, is that um, we have uh, been seeing global temperature rise uh, in the past 2,000 years. If you look at the left-hand chart, 
um, you can see that it's suddenly jumped uh, in the past 150 years, and which means after the Industrial Revolution. So we are now almost certain that this was all due to the mankind. And on the right-hand side, if you again um, look on the internet, you will find the term hockey stick. And this represents the shape of the temperature curve uh, in the past uh, 100 years. And um, a very famous uh, scientist, Michael Mann, who coined this name. And uh, there has been a lot of debates, uh, as a matter of fact. Uh, the science was not settled uh, until recently. And so in the past, you will find lots of um, um, discussion or even um, uh, skeptics uh, uh, talking about um, this is false, this is not science. And actually, uh, the fact is that this is 100% science, and we are now 100% sure. But we have wasted 10, 20 years in, in this deliberation. And do you recognize oh, what, what does this chart means to you? Actually, if I tell you that this is um, the temperature of our world in the past 150 years, uh, you can see the temperature increase just in the recent decades, uh, from the blues, really cool temperatures to really red hot. And if you look at other continents, this is the globe, but the other continents, we will see even redder, for example, in Asia. And uh, this chart has been used by a famous, uh, you, you heard about this Swedish girl who has been famous by now, um, appeared in all sorts of climate conferences, and uh, we are expecting her to, to make some, I think, noise uh, later on. This uh, uh, recent uh, interview, which I, I think I highly recommend to you uh, to understand what's going on and, and what it, it is all about for the young generation, for the young scientists. And uh, her new book, The Climate Book, utilized this uh, same chart, uh, just published last month. Um, greenhouse effect, I think uh, if you uh, study science, study physics, you all know what it's all about. So I'm not going to talk about the, um, the hard science, but uh, in fact point out to, to you that our global greenhouse gas emission has all along been increasing until 2020, when we have the so-called COVID, because of COVID, the recession. But uh, we're only seeing four or 5% decrease. Um, but the bad news is, even of this decrease, as you recognize that uh, we have been trapped uh, uh, in, at our homes and, and not going ever, anywhere, and uh, not much business ar around, but still, the decrease was only four, five percent. And and even worse, our global carbon dioxide concentration is still increasing without any click. Still increasing. This is just published last month uh, by the WMO. And uh, if you look uh, back for. Uh, 800,000 years or even uh, 2 million years, you can see the carbon dioxide, the methane, all these uh, global uh, greenhouse gases increased really, really much. And um, you can see that um, it's the highest level uh, in million years. And even if we look further back um, from other scientific um, um, uh, research, you can see that right now our temperature is actually similar level as at three million years ago. So what, what was the, the situation three million years ago? Actually, uh, at that same level of carbon dioxide concentration, our climate was two, uh, almost two to four degrees higher than now and the sea levels was even more, 10 to 30 meters more than today. So you may wonder whether we are heading in this direction. So COP21, um, I think uh, you all heard about the good news uh, a few years ago uh, at Paris, and, uh, and the world has come to agreement, 
uh, about uh, the, the two degrees uh, uh, limitation of, of the global temperatures uh, by the end of this century, and our targets uh, even better, 1.5 degrees uh, above pre-industrial level. But the problem of, the, of this um, uh, Paris Agreement is that um, it's not compulsory. The, uh, it depends on the nations, their own commitments that they will declare every few years. And so we have yet to know whether or not at this current COP27, we will see much more ambitious numbers in order to contain our temperatures. But uh, if we look at the charts, the current situation is that, well, on the left-hand side, you can see that uh, our actual emissions of the greenhouse gas, and you can see that uh, these might a slight decrease uh, in 2020. But our target, actually, if we look at what the nations have committed, uh, we are not going to end very well. Uh, if we look at uh, the, the level to be reached at 2050, we can see that if we want to achieve two degree temperature limitation, we have to do much, much more. And you can see the gap is huge. We, we need to reduce our carbon emissions by almost two thirds compared of, uh, with today. So it's a really, really a challenge, especially that we know from COVID, we haven't reduced very much. So you can, you can, you can appreciate the scale of the problem. Now, climate change, of course, will lead to sea level rise, and for Hong Kong, it is really a concern because uh, we are on the coast, and uh, we will expect multi-meter sea level rise in the next hundreds of years. Whether or not it will be reached by the end of this century, we have yet to know. The sea ice uh, at the Arctic actually has been reducing quite dramatically in the past decades. And uh, glaciers have been melting, and that's the source of the water uh, into the ocean, together with the thermal expansion, therefore we have sea level rise. And this is one of my own experience, uh, when, as I traveled to the same glacier uh, back in 1997, and then also 2015, and you can see how big the change of the glacier. I walked down to the glacier in 1997 and also in 2015, but then in 2015, you can see that we have to walk 20, 200 more steps in order to go down to reach the ice level. So you can, you can see that how the melting has been really, really tremendous that this is, this is really eye-opening for me as well. And so, yeah, if you look at this chart, you can appreciate what, what's going on the, over Greenland, over Antarctica, where our biggest ice sheets are, and the decrease has been accelerating. And uh, I have no time to, to, to show you this uh, movie, but uh, if you uh, can search on YouTube, please look for this um, chair, uh, movie, this is called The Chasing Ice, which reveal a really, uh, wow, ex really, really great collapse of uh, the ice sheet in 75 minutes of, of the area of the almost uh, half of the Kowloon Peninsula, the size, collapsed in 75 minutes. So you can appreciate how big the changes are. And so we have sea level rise, also accelerating. Uh, so there's no doubt we will be facing this challenge uh, in, in, in this uh, century. And uh, one of the uh, bad news is that uh, over the uh, western part of Antarctica, the ice sheet has become unstable and has passed the point of no return. What it means? It means that actually as the warm water beneath the ice sheet has start continue to erode uh, the, the, the ice sheet on the above, it's a matter of just the time when the ice sheet will totally collapse. If this part of the, of the Antarctica collapse, then we'll be seeing a meter in the rise of the sea level. 
only because of this, not not the whole Antarctica or, or the Greenland. So you can you can appreciate why we we are saying okay, three million years ago we will see ten to 50, thirty meters higher sea level. So this is one of the one of the component. So of course it's not just sea level rise, but also extreme heat, as you can. Uh, look around the world. Uh, you you know this summer in Europe. So because of the heat of the record breaking temperatures, we have excess death of more than 15,000 people. In Hong Kong, we have 15 days of 35 degrees or above. So it's 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 really happening. And of course, extreme rainfall as well. And uh, because of the warming, the atmosphere is able to hold more and more water. And therefore, the water cycle is being uh, accelerated. And therefore, when it rains, it rains heavier. When it's, it's drought, it's even worse. So that's the situation we are facing. Last year, we just saw lots of uh, flooding, heavy rain in Europe, in China. This year, we see the same situation in Korea the, with the uh, MTR flooded, <laughs> with all the cars floating around. But uh, at the same time, in Europe, we have drought. And also in China, in, in over southern China, you can see the, all the red area means serious drought. And it's still ongoing. The, the right-hand side picture is just yesterday. So the drought. Or even though Hong Kong is a little bit uh, more lucky, we have the rain from typhoons, but uh, in the southern China, they are still in drought. So what will happen in the next uh, 100 years or so? Well, we really don't know because we, we, it really depends on how the nations, will, the actions they will take. There are several different scenarios, but uh, depends on these scenarios. Uh, for example, the temperature, if we want to control it under 2 degrees or even 1.5 degrees, we need to go to the lower paths. But actually, the, the current situation is that based on the current commitments of the nations, we will see temperature rise near 3 degrees at the end of this century, 3 degrees. So if you think Again, three million years ago, where were, where were we? We were two, between two to four degrees higher than now. And so this three degrees is about right. So this varying. Of course, for heavy rain, it's going to be uh, uh, more significant depending on the pathways. Um, for extreme heat, uh, one of the worry also is that uh, we are seeing actually large, higher numbers of very hot days, even now, uh, compared with 100 years ago, we are talking about seven times of more very hot days than 100 years ago, which is higher than the projection for the globe. And actually, last year, we have 22 times more. We have 54 days of very hot days. And for hot nights, it means 28 degrees uh, uh, in, in the lower, temper lower temperatures. Uh, even worse, last year we, see, we saw 61 nights of hot nights, which means 100 times of that 100 years ago. For extreme rainfall also, uh, Hong Kong has been seeing doubling of heavy rain frequency in the past 100 years, which also is uh, higher than the, than the global average. And uh, our rainfall record has been broken in the past every several decades, but uh, in the recent years, every several years. So the record breaking has been also become more frequent. So all this will lead to another risk is about landslides, because we have, the government has been doing a lot of things about to, to, to control the, the man-made slopes. But for natural slopes, if our rainfall become more extreme, there will be a tipping point. When our rainfall, the daily rainfall becomes a significant number of the annual rainfall, something like 20%, then we will see sudden increase 
of the natural terrain landslide above the, the, the usual uh, man-made slope landslide. And this is a challenge for us. And for the sea ice, of course, uh, it will decrease. And, uh, and perhaps by 2030, just in 10 years' time, we may start to see ice-free Arctic Ocean. But the worries for us is, is that the sea level actually is going to rise no matter what, no, even if we stop the carbon emission today. Uh, by up to one meter, this is uh, on average, but then if um, the Antarctica sea ice, the ice sheet really collapse, then this will lead to even more uh, a phenomenal increase. Uh, the IPCC named this as low confidence but high impact scenarios, which may put our sea level to even two meters or even more by the end of this century. And for tropical cyclones, of course, uh, we have uh, frequent risks of tropical cyclones and uh, they will become more intense and also bring more heavy rain. So um, is it gloomy? Well, yes, I, I think um, we have to be prepared for the worst. And storm surge, I think you all recognize uh, because of typhoons. In the past, we have the Hato just a few years ago, uh, bringing flooding to our car parks underground. Even in Macau, the water actually had, at a certain time reached two meters above the ground in the old district. And if you like, uh, you can take a look at the, the observatory's uh, videos. And Mangut in 2018 also really, really significant typhoon. And we expect that if Mangut didn't land over Luzon, it, it, and it keeps its intensity, it will have brought, brought even more significant impact to Hong Kong. But we were lucky. The typhoon weakened by 30% on landing over Luzon. So if it keeps its intensities, then the flooding we will see is, will be much more significant around the Victoria Harbor, around Tolo Harbor, all we see are flooded coastal zones. So as a summary, uh, we, will, we will see more heat wave, uh, more storm surge, and, uh, and of course, uh, uh, we need to do more uh, to adapt ourselves to climate change. Um, and uh, last year at Glasgow, we hear our Swedish girl saying that we have 30 years of blah, blah, blah without reaching any result. And let's see what will happen this year at COP27. But uh, we all know that um, the global risk, you know what, it's not nuclear bomb, it's climate action failure on top of the list, as recognized by the Global Econ World Economic Forum. And you know, COVID is just ranked number five. So you see, it's, it is a much bigger issue for us and for the future generations, much larger in scale and magnitude. So we have to be prepared by not just mitigation, by, by going to carbon neutral, but also by adaptation. And by the way, we will have a, a, another conference on the climate adaptation uh, in early December. Please take a look. If you're interested, please join us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Shen. Please be seated. And thank you for addressing the issue of global warming and greenhouse effect, as well as rise in sea level, as a great start to our seminar today. In a minute, the presentation section will begin with the sharing by three scientists and experts who are studying climate change. They will share with us their respective work and ideas regarding this topic. And joining us online from the UK, we have Professor Chris Butt. And joining us here in person, we have Dr. Timothy Bonebreak from the University of Hong Kong and Professor Amos Tai from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Now, without further ado, may we now invite Dr. Bonebreak, Associate Professor of School of Biological Sciences at the University of Hong Kong, to come on stage and present for us. Dr. Bonebreak, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to the Hong Kong Laureate Forum for having me here. Thank you all for coming here and also online. It's a real pleasure to have this opportunity to discuss 
um, climate change impacts on tropical biodiversity. And in particular, I want to focus on the implications for nature and also health. Oops, sorry, one. <laughs> when we think about climate change impacts, this is often what we think about, right? So we think about uh, biodiversity, we think about animals, and we think about polar bears. Um, that's a very common sort of image that we have in our minds. And often, actually, if you Google climate change impacts, you'll, you'll see lots of images of polar bears. So this is a common sort of image we have in our head when we're thinking about climate change impacts. And there's a good reason for that. So uh, we heard all about the IPCC, which is great. So I don't have to go into a lot of detail. Um, but this is uh, a mapping, a geographic mapping of historic warming over the globe. And so if you see the, all that red in the poles, that's consistent with a high degree of warming. A lot of warming has happened in the poles. And so naturally, that's why we think of things like polar bears and are, we're worried about sea ice. There's a lot of good reasons to be worried about those things. But in fact, if you look at the amount of warming that's occurred relative to the annual variation in temperature, so seasonal variation in temperature, you see a very different picture. So this is also from the IPCC report. And a lot of this red here in the tropics, that's an indication that even though the warming hasn't been as great in the tropics, the amount of warming relative to the natural variation experienced in those areas is actually quite high. So we see a lot of red there, which is an indication of sort of warming that's beyond our historical experience and beyond the historical experience of the animals and plants that are living there. And so now there's quite a bit of concern about what is happening to the plants and animals in those areas. And of course, as we just learned, um, if you look at the projections of one and a half degrees up to four degrees of warming, depending on the scenario, you see a very startling, whoops, sorry. <laughs> you see a very startling picture um, of quite a bit of warming. And also we hear all about these other impacts, extreme climate impacts, sea level rise, um, tropical cyclones. So these are all changing. And I, I won't talk a lot about those today, but these things are also really important for animals and plants. And so likely some of the biggest impacts to plants and animals from climate change will occur from these things. But I'll focus on warming today just because it's kind of simpler and there's also a lot of important impacts in terms of warming. So I want to focus today on how will tropical biodiversity respond to future warming. Zero in on the tropics. So is climate change a threat to tropical biodiversity? There's a fundamental problem that we have uh, in ecology, which is most of what we know about ecological systems comes from research, decades and centuries of research that's occurred in the UK, in Europe, and in North America. So we, have a lot, we know a lot about those ecosystems, but we don't know so much about tropical ecosystems. But that's a real problem because actually most species live in the tropics. Uh, so this is a survey done which looks at species ranges. And so all that green for corals and birds and amphibians and freshwater fish, that's just indication that most of those animals live in the tropics. So despite the fact that most animals and plants live in these areas, uh, we don't know much about those species. But we've known for about 10 years, because of that issue of the variation in temperature, that tropical biodiversity is likely to be highly vulnerable to climate change. But despite that, we again, because we don't have much data, there aren't a whole lot of demonstrations of how tropical biodiversity will respond, respond to warming. So this is just one example. Um, this is from a master student who was in my laboratory, uh, Feng Yi Guo. And so she found data. All these data points are species range shifts across elevation. So one of the expectations is that species should move their, their ranges up elevation to match warming, right? So it's, it's cooler up slope, so they'll move faster. One thing you'll notice, again, <laughs> most of the data is from North America and Europe. We actually don't know much about the tropical species. 
But if we look at range shifts, so the rate of range shift, this figure is a little complicated, but I'll walk you through it. So this is the range shift, the, the, how fast the species are moving. And this is plants, animals, all sorts of things. And this is forest loss percentage. So we anticipated that the amount of war the, the rate of species shifts would also be a consequence of forest loss. And what we see is the yellow, the yellow and the orange, those are tropical areas. And what we see is that the, the rain shifts are, are faster with more forest loss. So basically forest loss together with climate change is anticipated to increase the rate that species are moving. But we see the opposite trend in these blue areas. So actually the highest rate of rain shifts is actually in areas where there isn't a lot of forest loss. So the main point here is that tropical ecosystems are very different from temperate ecosystems. Um, and in particular, tropical species are at risk from both climate change and habitat loss. I want to come to Hong Kong and I'll, I'm going to talk about some of the research we've been doing on Hong Kong on Lepidoptera, so both butterflies and moths. Butterflies and moths are very sensitive to uh, temperature, and so we can learn a lot uh, about how climate is changing if we watch and see what happens to the butterflies and moths of Hong Kong. And we're very fortunate in Hong Kong because we have a lot of data. A lot of people have been studying and tracking the butterflies and moths, so we can learn a lot about climate change impacting biodiversity broadly by seeing what's happening to our local fauna. So the first thing is Hong Kong is warming. Um, so you can see here quite a bit of warming in the past uh, 10 to 15 years. And during that time, we've been very lucky. So this is research that we've, my lab has been doing in collaboration with the Feng Yun Butterfly Reserve in Tai Po. And they have been monitoring the butterflies in Feng Yun um, since 2008. And this is Yut Feng Ling, who's a PhD student in my lab. And so he looked at all this data from 2008 and looked to see if there were changes in that community consistent with how much warming we've seen. So I want to get into the details a little bit because it's kind of fun and interesting. So to look at the changes, we calculate what we call the species temperature index. And the species temperature index is just we know where the species is distributed. Uh, so 20 degrees is the mean annual temperature here, just, just as a, an example. And it's here, here, and then we have three locations where it's 30, 30, 30. If we take the average, then we can say the species temperature index is about 25 degrees, right? And the species temperature index, if us, the species are located up here, it's going to be cooler, right? Then, if we know the species temperature indices for all these different species, on any given day, you can count all these butterflies, and then you can take the average, which would be the community temperature index. So it's essentially a way to track how hot or cold the butterfly communities are based on the different types of species we're seeing. And so in Feng Yun, what we see is pretty dramatic. So this is the community temperature index, and this is uh, 2008 to 2020, and we see a pretty steep incline, so an increase in the community temperature index. So in other words, the butterflies that we're seeing there are, are they tend to be more warm adapted, uh, and they're, they're, they're basically the, the, the communities are hotter. And there's a very strong correlation with the, e the mean annual temperature. So in fact, in 2020 and 2019, which are the hottest years in this time period, it's also the highest amount of community temperature index. So that those are the hottest butterfly communities. So we're seeing these community changes very consistent with warming. We've all, you may have seen this in the news. There's also been new species of butterflies to Hong Kong. We've, we've counted in the past 20 years almost 20 new species of butterfly, which is pretty remarkable. Now, whether or not those butterflies are here because of climate change, we're not sure. But we have some evidence to suggest that at least some of the species are likely in Hong Kong now because of warming. So this is one example. This is Euripus nictilius. Uh, this arrived in about 2007 in Hong Kong. And if you look at its distribution, uh, this is based on the species temperature index, a, a more complicated version of that. And so this is where we expect to find this butterfly. And historically, it wasn't found in Hong Kong, 
But if we look at climate change, you see all that red, we can run climate change scenarios and see how is the climate suitability predicted to increase over, over time. And we see a lot of red in Hong Kong, suggestive of the fact that the climatic suitability has increased for the species. So this might be why we see this species here. Moths. Moths get a bad rap, <laughs> which is unfortunate because moths are, are super cool. They're really pretty. Um, we, have about, we have at least 2,000 species in Hong Kong. Uh, there could be as many three, as 3,000. Uh, if you want to discover new species in Hong Kong, study moths. There are many to be discovered. And so we've looked at this issue in moths of Hong Kong as well. And this is in collaboration with uh, Roger Kendrick, uh, who's been counting the moths in Hong Kong for 25 years. And Wen Da Chung is a PhD student, was a former PhD student in my lab. And we found the same pattern in moths. Uh, so this is Hirochroma viridaria and Alex palparia. These are moth species that we never saw, that were never seen in the beginning of Roger's monitoring, but now we see them very commonly. Uh, and again, we think that climate is likely one of the reasons why we see these species. All right, so we know our communities, ecological communities are changing. For example, in, in Hong Kong, we're, we're, very, we're seeing these effects. Um, of distribution changes and population changes. So does it matter? So again, I wanted to focus on the implications of these changes. We're seeing these changes in the biodiversity. And the short answer is yes, <laughs> it matters a lot. Um, so this is uh, just a sort of depiction of some of the impacts we're likely to see. So I've been talking a lot about ecosystem health. So natural ecosystems, of course, are changing as a response to warming and species changing their distributions. But we also anticipate that there will be climate feedbacks. So the climate system itself is likely to change as uh, species are shifting their distributions. And human well-being. We're likely to see changes in uh, diseases and food security as a consequence of food crops shifting their distributions and disease vectors changing their distributions. This is just one example, looking at climate change impacts on uh, a variety of different species that are vectors for disease. Um, so we know that most, species, most diseases come from other animals, right? So COVID-19, the reason why we're, we're all wearing masks right now, uh, came from a bat. Uh, the reservoir is a bat. We don't know how it got to humans, but we know there was some kind of zoonotic transmission. Um, and we're going to see more of those types of zoonotic transmissions as species start mixing together in novel and unexpected ways. So this is a study looking at um, the, number, the population density and also the viral sharing that's predicted under climate change. And you can see Asia as a real hotspot. We're, we're expecting and anticipating more of these kinds of events. There's social and economic consequences. This is the, um, the caterpillar fungus, which you might have, have tried, uh, which makes up 40% of the rural economy in Tibet. This is a hugely important commodity and species. Um, what we're seeing that it's shifting up slope. We're seeing these changes, and that's going to have real economic and social consequences. So to sum up, Climate change is driving a redistribution of biodiversity globally. And we're seeing those impacts especially significantly in the tropics. So again, thinking about the polar bear, it's not just polar bears, it's not just the poles. We are seeing those impacts broadly. Uh, and it's happening in the places where most of our animals and plants live. And it's ha happening often in very dramatic ways. We're seeing those impacts now in Hong Kong. So Hong Kong is a great natural laboratory for studying these things. That's why I love working here. There's, you can see all the, the amazing mountains and, and see, uh, you can look at the marine and terrestrial life and see what's happening right here in our backyard with respect to tropical biodiversity. So it's a great place to do research and study these things. So these changes are a signal of impacts to come. So just because we're seeing it in the butterflies and moths, like I said, they're a good indicator. But whether or not what's happening in the butterflies and moths are going to impact us, I don't know. But all of those other things, food, 
crops and uh, insect pests and insect vectors for diseases. All those things are also changing. And that's going to impact uh, our, our society in really important ways. So the last thing, and, and probably the most important thing I want to kind of focus on and dive down on, is the need to manage and adapt. Okay, so as I've said, there's, there's a lot of uncertainty in how climate change is going to impact tropical biodiversity. It's gonna, I've been focusing on changes in distributions of species, but we're also likely going to see extinctions, uh, novel mixing of communities, and we've talked about all these different impacts. So what do we do? We have to act, right? Even though there's a lot of uncertainty, even though we don't know everything that's going to happen, we have to act. And so uh, two things. We already learned about them in the previous presentation, right? So we need to mitigate. So the first thing we need to do is, is to reduce emissions. So we have to lower those curves, bend the curve, as they say, both in terms of climate change and biodiversity loss. We have to make sure that our futures have lower CO2 emissions, have lower warming. That's the best thing we can do uh, to reduce the impacts on biodiversity. And there are all sorts of ways to do that, of course, right? So there's all sorts of important technologies that you all hopefully will start working on. Um, uh, we can in, in institute different economic policies and, and lower our emissions. And the second thing we have to do is adapt, right? So we need to think about ways these species are going to move. These consequences will happen. So what do, what do we do about them? Uh, well, we have to act, right? So we need to th rethink the way we do environmental management. And that's something that my lab is also working on. It's saying, okay, well, we know these species are going to move. We know we're going to have these novel communities and these changes here in Hong Kong and elsewhere. What do we do about that? How do we ensure that s new species that come to Hong Kong are, are accommodated? How do we, we prevent the loss of species from Hong Kong? How do we make sure that the, the future of Hong Kong keeps and, and retains all of our biodiversity? So these are important things that uh, we need everyone on board to help us out, and um, I hope you'll join me in doing that. Uh, thank you. These are some of my collaborators and students. Uh, this is my lab, uh, and I really appreciate the time and your energy. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Bonebreak. Please be seated. Thank you once again for talking to us about biodiversity and specifically the implications of climate change in Hong Kong. And we look forward to discussing further with you in the panel discussion. Next, let's welcome our next speaker, Professor Amos Tai, Associate Professor and Director of Earth System Science Program of Faculty of Science at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Please welcome Professor Tai. Thank you very much. I'm extremely uh, happy to be here to share with you some of our research. And actually, Tim, I uh, have already covered uh, quite a lot of bases uh, that uh, I think some of the slides I can definitely skip. But uh, at the same time, I hope that what I'm going to present today will bring another aspect and dimensions of climate change that uh, we all should be uh, concerned about. So just a little bit about uh, my research overall. Uh, I look, I'm an atmospheric scientist by training. I look at the interactions between the atmosphere and the biosphere and also agriculture. So one of the things we look a lot at is the uh, impacts of air pollution and climate change together on agricultural productivity uh, and forest productivities. And this is something that I would definitely touch on today because it relates to how climate change is affecting our society. I also look a lot at how changes in the vegetation, land use, and forest management, especially in response to climate change, can actually further affect air quality. For instance, you have seen a lot of wildfires over the past few years, and these wildfires definitely have been worsened by rising temperature and drought in various regions, and they would in turn affect air quality because wildfires emit a lot of really bad stuff that are bad for health, and we expect that climate change will continue to worsen wildfires wildfires in different places and thus affecting people's health. And this is something that uh, we are also looking at. But on the other hand, instead of just oh, feeling very upset about oh, climate change is going to affect our life, there are definitely ways through which we can help with the problem. I focus particularly on how we can 
improve our food production method and our consumption pattern in order to mitigate pollution and climate change. And this is something hopefully will give you some hope because this is something that all of us here can help to do in order to reduce the impacts of climate change. So um, just a word about how I do it. So for most of the results that I show from my lab, uh, we, we are, sorry, we are um, a, a numerical modeler, so I'm a computational scientist. We run uh, model, numerical models in supercomputers to basically do projections for the future or understand how the world res will respond in different situations. So our work re involves a lot of uh, mathematics, uh, physics, chemistry, and computation. So if you are interested in you know, math, science, and uh, computation uh, and want to use those skills to uh, help with the environment, definitely uh, this is an area where you can uh, be, out, be in. All right. So let's see. Yep. So um, uh, Mr. Shun have already given a very good introduction into what what, what those these models that we run on a typical basis, uh, what they project for the future. So I can uh, pr probably just uh, skip most of it just to highlight that. Uh, temperature has been rising, the poles warming faster than the tropics, which Tim also uh, has pointed out. But I would like to uh, talk about this uh, in particular. We have this prediction that um, usually dry places would get drier and wet places would get uh, wetter, and there would be more frequent intense drought, floods, and rainstorms, and all of this would be very much uh, impactful on agricultural production, some of the things that I look particularly at. And sea level, of course, keep rising. So Tim has already talked about how uh, climate change will inter influence uh, global biodiversity. But it on not only affect, uh, and he also talked about how that may be related to our health. And definitely, a lot of people are still thinking of um, climate change as something that would affect the polar bears. But a lot of studies have already shown climate change have been affecting every single aspect of our life already, including our health, our economy, our food security, our water resources. For instance, you can see here, uh, natural disaster, obviously. Uh, Mr. Shun has already shown how floods can affect our home and leading to the loss of life. Heat stress is particularly bad. They can uh, really actually kill people, especially those who are uh, elderly and those who are al already uh, sick to begin with. Um, I will talk a little bit more about this. Uh, climate change can also worsen air pollution, uh, cause infectious disease to be more prevalent because a lot of the factors uh, carrying the disease, like uh, insects, which uh, Tim has studied, and also bacteria uh, and other disease-causing agent, they can become more prevalent and more active when the temperature is rising and when water it becomes more intense. And uh, yeah, so I would particularly like to focus on one aspect, how climate change threatens crop production. So crops are particularly sensitive to temperature, right? Especially during the growing season. Here I am showing you two graphs uh, in some previous research. You can see here, at a higher temperature, or when temperature is um, deviate more, okay, further from the mean on a higher side, okay, if it is a few degrees higher than normal, then crop yield can be greatly reduced. So, as a rule of thumb, about 10% reduction would be in place uh, for every one degree Celsius of temperature rise. So this is like kind of like a rule of thumb. Of course, different crops and different regions would have some variance of that. But on average, that is a pretty good uh, indicator or a pretty good uh, number to remember, right? So, and assuming uh, no change in growing season length, crop production of USA in America can decrease by up to 80% by the end of this century. And not only in America, actually. And my research later showed that climate change can have myriad, myriad effects on agriculture. Of course, the heat extreme coming from higher temperature can affect uh, agricultural production, as I've just shown you. What my research have also found is that another factor, air pollution, namely, which would have a common source, you know, fossil fuel combustion basically giving you climate change, but it also gives air pollution. One of the particular pollutants called surface ozone 
which is not the ozone in the ozone layer. I'm not talking about that because that ozone is good for us. They screen away the UV radiation for us. But the ozone that happens around us is indeed very toxic to us. They oxidize, us our, they oxidize our lungs and causing a lot of diseases. And they also oxidize the food. So they surface ozone cause great damage to the crops and plants as well. As you can see, crops being exposed to ozone can have such kind of damage. But what we have particularly seen is that climate change itself can worsen ozone pollution because the chemistry, because of the emissions, can all be heightened under climate change. So in a work that we published a couple of years ago in Nature Climate Change, we have seen that indeed part of the impacts, you know, part of the previously observed warming effect on crop that a lot of studies have already found is indeed due to the correlation between, just part of, not all, but is, in, is due to the correlation between high temperature and ozone. So not only high temperature itself can affect the crop, but high temperature causing more ozone to exist around, that ozone can also damage crop. So this is what we have found. And we further found that model projections, we run our model, warming and ozone pollution together can cause a global crop production loss of about 15% and undernourishment rate, rate, people not having enough food to eat to rise by 50%, right? This is actually quite serious, but not all hope is uh, lost. We found that if we control ozone by reducing the emissions of ozone precursors, okay, controlling cars and industry emissions, so on and so forth, can cut that crop loss to only 9%, kind of you know, reducing it by half, and also reduces undernourishment. So we think, uh, we believe, air pollution control together with climate change mitigation, these two things, uh, oftentimes different people care about them, all right? The uh, air quality people usually are concerned with the health impacts, uh, whereas climate change people are concerned with, you know, climate change, of course. But th these, when they're done together, okay, they can have substantial co-benefits for human health and food security on top of growing ozone and uh, heat uh, resistant cultivars. So uh, we have done some further study and to see uh, kind of the same thing, uh, crop yield can be greatly drop, uh, declining, all right, due to both ozone and climate change. As you can see, uh, we have done the projection for up to uh, the next century, following the most current uh, projections of climate. And then, in, but this particular study have found, has uh, found that uh, the right yield can be reduced by up to 40% in India. And India is already, right now, one of the most uh, food insecure regions in the world. So here I'm showing you the under-nourishment rate. In India, about, you know, more than, about more than 20%, uh, more than 20% of the population is actually uh, constantly undernourished, not having enough food to even carry out their daily uh, activities. And this situation will only make it worse. So I have talked quite a lot about, okay, climate change is impacting uh, crop production, causing malnourishment in different places. There is another side of the story. Indeed, a lot of the, uh, oftentimes we know, is the fossil fuel combustion, right, from energy and transportation that is causing climate change. But what fewer people talk about is that the agricultural industry, all right, the growing of crops and the raising of animals for our meat is actually a, one of the major contributors to climate change as well. So indeed, agriculture is responsible for up to 40% of the global greenhouse gas emission. It's because we have to clear the land to make way for farms and to raise the animals, all right? So deforestation, when we burn down the forest, CO2 is released. N2O is another very important greenhouse gas. When we apply fertilizer and when we raise the animals, which give off you know, their animal waste, these have a lot of nitrogen in them. And N2O, as a really potent greenhouse gas, can also be released along the way. Well, cattle, right? Cattle, cows, they are called a ruminant, okay? So they, their digestive system can also emit a lot of methane. So methane is another very potent greenhouse gas. 
So a lot of, because of all of these different causes, agriculture can greatly, is responsible for quite a big amount of greenhouse gases and thus climate change. So I'm going not, okay, so let's focus on climate change today and also air pollution. Again, fertilizer use and pesticides itself, they can lead to air and water pollution. And uh, a lot of these, air pollution, water pollution, and climate and greenhouse gases, even though they're different kinds of problems, but they all have common sources, like uh, agriculture, fertilizer use, uh, animal raising, animal husbandry. So you can see again, about right now, about 30% of the uh, yeah, about 30% of the global greenhouse gases from agriculture, agricultural production. And when you really go deeper, I want to kind of, um, we, we want to think about, so, okay, food is responsible for greenhouse gas, like at least 40% of it, I mean, at least 30% of it. So how are we going to, to go about it? What, what can we do? Then we have to look closer, deeper into what exactly is being emitted. Indeed, quite a lot, lot, large number, like quite a lot of greenhouse gas is actually just emitted from the cattle, the cows, okay? This means uh, they're basically the gases coming off their uh, uh, digestive system, all right? Land use change, which is related to basically clearing the forest to make way for agriculture is a major chunk of it as well. Uh, the process of fertilizer use, is, this is mostly about fertilizer use. And surprisingly, the transportation of uh, food is not the major source. Well, it is still there, but it's not the major source. But most of the greenhouse gas is actually produced before the production by clearing the forest, and also because of the production process itself by the application of fertilizer and uh, the animals giving off uh, nitrogen and methane. So that really tells us something about how, what we can do to help with this situation. So, and also, not all food give you the same uh, greenhouse gas emission. You can see here, some food are definitely worse than others. And very obviously, you see that meat, especially cattle, bovine meats means beef, okay? Beef is by far the worst. It is a major contributor to greenhouse gas emission among food production. If you look at this, you can already, already see, even if I just try to change the way I eat by adjusting the kind of food I choose to eat, I can greatly shift my greenhouse, personal greenhouse gas emission, maybe from this side towards that side. And you can really see the, the differences can be huge. And one of the reasons, of course, why uh, uh, meat is particularly bad or cow is particularly bad is that if you feed grains or plants to, if, okay, let, let me take a step back. If we just eat them, we can get, let's say, 100 calories back. But if we use them to feed the animals, they have to do their things, they have to, you know, live and carry out their own activities. After all, we can only get, if you feed them to cows, we can only get three calories back, right, by eating the beef from this, okay? So you can really see meat production is highly energy inefficient because a lot of the energy is actually wasted along there because of their own activities, right? So this already is, is a very substantial constraint on how much we can actually eat. If everybody wants to eat more meat, definitely we do not have enough land and crop yield and everything to, in order to provide the world with that appetite. So I'm going to wrap up soon. This is just a study that we have done, uh, particularly looking at China. We know that uh, Chinese people have been uh, eating more meat. Basically, we are eating more uh, five times more meat than 30 years ago, all right? And then the Chinese population is also rising, okay? We are eating more meat-intensive diet right now, uh, and that would lead to climate change because of the greenhouse gas emission, and that also have direct health impact because meat is you know, bad for uh, uh, causing colorectal cancer and other diseases. What my research have also found is that because the growing of uh, the animal, okay, have to use a lot of feed, 
the feed is from the fertilizer, right? You use fertilizer to grow the corn and soybean to feed the animals, and the animals themselves also give a lot of waste. All of these can contribute to ammonia emission, which uh, I'm not going to discuss too much today. Ammonia is a major contributor to particle pollution. Basically, the haze that you see sometimes across the harbor, they are PM2.5. For China, 20 to 30% of the PM2.5 is actually from ammonia, and they are mostly from the production of meat. And then that would have indirect health impacts. So I'm not going to discuss too much about it because time is running up, and uh, what we found is that, yeah, Sorry, what we found is that um, sustainable farming methods and also dietary choices, if we actually try to switch our diet from a more meat intensive diet to more plant based diet, actually are important strategies for mitigate both air pollution in China in, and in other parts of the developing world and also mitigating the environmental impacts of agriculture, including of course greenhouse gas emission and other sorts of pollution as well. And even if you, not, I'm not saying everybody should be a vegetarian, but even by just eating one, uh, one day, you know, like having one day with, uh, in a week without any meat, you can already reduce greenhouse gas emission by quite a bit. If you reduce red meat, especially cows and milk beef, you can even further reduce your personal greenhouse emission uh, from your diet. All right. So I'm not saying everybody should become a vegetarian or vegan, but we can definitely do small steps, and these small steps added together can really help. Finally, yeah, yeah. So, yep. Yeah. So these are my research, and I uh, hope to con have convinced you that um, every one of us, through what we choose to do and what we choose to eat, can actually help with this issue of climate change. All right. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Professor Tai. Please be seated. Thank you for sharing with us how climate change has an impact on the agriculture industry as well as how it impacts the humankind and how everybody can take a little step and contribute to a big impact. And next, we're very excited to have a great mathematician joining us live on Zoom and all the way from the UK. He is Professor Chris Budd, Professor of Applied Mathematics of Department of Mathematical Science at University of Bath. Let's welcome Professor Budd from the UK. Hi, Professor Budd, very happy to have you here. Nice to be here, um, all the way from the UK where it's raining hard here. So I'm going to tell a bit about how the models that we heard about in the previous two talks actually work and how maths and data science can be used to predict the climate into the future. So we all know and we've seen in the previous talks that our climate is, is changing rapidly. Why do we know that at the moment? Uh, because we have lots of sources of data that we have available which we can use to measure the climate. These can be uh, satellites or uh, temperature measurements made on the ground, or we can use radar, or we can use measurements from ships and boats. What do these measurements show us? Well, not surprisingly, that the temperature of the world is rapidly rising. Here are some temperature measurements made by the UK Met Office, which was founded in 1850. These are direct temperature measurements. And you can see from this that in the last uh, around about 150 or so years, the temperature of the Earth has gone up significantly by something like one and a half to two degrees. There are natural variations along the way, but the overall rise in temperature is undeniable. We can also measure the number of extreme temperature days. That's where you have a temperature in the UK above 30 degrees, probably different in Hong Kong. Um, but you can see from this that the number of extreme temperature days is increasing and that is a direct consequence also of climate change. Here's a rather scary picture. These are measurements from a NASA satellite looking at the Arctic and it's the amount of ice in the Arctic in the summer and these are measurements from 1979 and these direct radar measurements show a significant drop in the amount of ice that we have in the Arctic and are predicting that by the end of this century there'll be no summer ice in the Arctic at all. And that has enormous impacts not only 
on um, our overall climate, but also on the circulation patterns in the oceans themselves. Um, here's a picture of sea rise. This is highly relevant to uh, island nations like Hong Kong and the UK. And the temperature, the sea is, is rising by about three and a half millimeters per year. Um, this is a consequence both of uh, fresh water coming into the sea um, and also as the temperature of the sea increases with climate change, so the water expands and so sea level rises. And this has an enormous impact on, as I said, island nations such as ourselves. So these are direct measurements which are clearly showing that climate change is happening. We can also go back in the past. So a climate skeptic will often say, well, climate is changing now, but it's always changed in the past. And that is true, but it's changed in the past much more slowly. How do we know this? Well, there are various ways of measuring what happened in the past. We can look at tree rings. We can look at uh, records. Uh, for example, uh, the Romans were keeping records of, of weather. We can look at pollen. But the best way of seeing what happened in the past is to drill down into the ice, you know, particularly in Greenland and the Antarctic, and measure the amount of carbon dioxide and oxygen in various isotopes in the ice. And that gives us a very, very clear indication that the, uh, of what the temperature was going back several million years. And this is a, a graph, one of my favorite graphs, showing the temperature of the Earth measured uh, about um, half a million years ago to the present. Um, the blue curve shows the temperature estimated by a European measurement of the ice. The green curve, um, a Russian measurement. And the red curve shows the total amount of ice. And what's interesting with this is that we see if we go back all these um, thousands of years, the Earth's climate very much just change, um, but it changes on a time scale of uh, 10 to 100,000 years. And we see um, warming periods followed by um, ice ages, followed by warming periods, followed by ice ages. So the Earth's climate has been changing, but it changes on much slower time scales than we're seeing at the moment. So what are we seeing at the moment? Well, these are the temperatures uh, of uh, the overall temperature of the Earth uh, measured in the last 2,000 years. The Earth gradually warmed up into the medieval warm period, and then it cooled down. That was due to the sun uh, reducing its activity until about 18, um, the year 1800. And at that point, and I'm afraid the UK is particularly guilty for this, uh, we started burning a lot of fossil fuels. And this is what the temperature's done uh, in the last uh, 100 or so years. Um, this is called the hockey stick, and uh, it shows the very rapid rise in the Earth's uh, climate uh, temperature, um, which is entirely due, we think, to the burning of fossil fuels and also agriculture and other aspects of human activity. This is uh, also what we might like to think as uh, one of the reasons for this. This is the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, again going back uh, about uh, half a million years, uh, which goes up and down regularly um, as we go in and out of ice ages, uh, going from a minimum of about 175 parts per million to about two, 300 parts per million. But again, since we started burning fossil fuels, this is what the carbon dioxide has done. It's massively increased, and it is increasing very, very fast indeed. And these are some measurements taken at Hawaii and the Moana Loa Laboratory. And this is called the Keeling Curve, showing the uh, in the last 60 or so years from 1960, the amount of carbon dioxide going from 320 parts per million to about 420 parts per million. And this is absolutely an indicator that we are putting a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, and that can cause climate change. However, what do we think is really going on? Um, if you are a climate skeptic, you might argue, well, the rise in carbon dioxide that we're measuring is due to a natural uh, effect due to the increase in the temperature of the Earth. Conversely, if you believe in climate change caused by human activity, you might say that the carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere is driving the increase in the Earth's temperature. Or neither could be important, they could be un unrelated. So how do we know what's actually going on? Um, and this is where mathematical models are absolutely vital to show us what's actually happening. 
This is a, a picture taken from the IPCC report. Um, in the black line, we see the observed temperature of the Earth from 1850 to the present day. And what the blue curve is, is a model which starts with the temperature going back into 1850, but doesn't include the increase in carbon dioxide due to human activity. And the blue curve in that model shows that the Earth's temperature, if it wasn't for human activity, would have stayed roughly constant over those 150 years or so. In contrast, if you put in the impact of carbon dioxide due to human activity and natural drivers such as volcanoes, we get the red curve. And that red curve shows without question that it's carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere which is impacting on the earth temperature and causing it to rise. It also shows the red curve and the black curve are pretty well in line that the models are actually working. So mathematical predictions are actually correct. They can be tested and are tested very carefully. And um, if you then run the models forward, we get this picture which we've seen in the other presentations of the Earth's temperature uh, rising by between two and five degrees, according to the model um, and according to various climate centers. Um, why are there differences? Well, they're largely dependent on, on what we think human activity is going to be. Um, when we run a model, we put in various scenarios for how much carbon dioxide you might put in if you're uh, doing various things. Um, and these are called uh, representative climate projections. Um, and the worst one is 8.5, predicts a 3.7 degree centigrade rise in temperature by the end of this century. And that's if we carry on as we are. Um, and conversely, if we switch completely to renewables, um, cycle everywhere, and try to suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, we can keep the temperature down to a one degree rise, which is basically okay. And these pictures show the various um, things that happen uh, if you do various things. So these are predictions made by mathematical models. What is a climate model? Well, it's a mathematical and computer simulation of the climate, starting with the laws of physics, informed and tested against data, which we can then run forward to predict the climate. So that's what a model is. Um, and there are various types of models. Um, the ones that are run on supercomputers by the IPCC are called general circulation models. They're really expensive to run, uh, they're millions of lines of code, and they can make predictions over a few decades into the future. So that's what the IPCC uses. Um, mathematicians like myself often use simpler models called um, uh, Earth Models of Intermediate Complexity, or EMIX, um, where we can actually do mathematical analysis. And these are very useful both to test the big models and also to look at things like ice ages and what might happen over um, longer periods of time. And the simplest type of models are called energy balance models, where you just look at the Earth as a single thing with a single temperature and balance en energy. Um, and these are actually very effective for doing sensitivity calculations. You can run them on a laptop very quickly and have been around since the 1870s when they were first introduced by the uh, physicist Arrhenius. So this is what we call um, the hierarchy of different models um, um, that are then used to predict the climate. Um, but modeling the climate is, is hard, despite um, all these models. Here's a very famous quote from Niels Bohr, who said it's difficult to predict anything, especially about the future. Um, why is it hard? Well, it's hard to get uh, the data, and data, all data has statistical variations. Um, climate models are, are nonlinear, and you get the impact of what's called chaos, which means that small changes now can lead to large changes later on. The climate is entirely complex, which makes it quite hard to get these models right. And we have to try to distinguish between cause and effect and between natural and human made variation. So that's kind of the difficulty we have in using models. Um, but having said that, they are still by far our best way to look into the future. Um, we can be objective when we use the models. If, if I talk to a policymaker or a politician, I can be quite clear about the assumptions and approximations that are used. Um, and once you've got a model, you can understand it's the sensitivity of the climate. In other words, you can change parameters like the, the mean temperature. Um, and that shows you exactly why you're likely to get um, extreme events, of course, uh, into the future. 
And we can also use the models to predict other things, like if you, you not only how the climate is changing, but also how it might impact on flooding, and as we saw in the last presentation, how it might impact on food. So I want to uh, talk a little bit now about how models work. I'll then talk a bit about uh, one or two simple models um, before I conclude. So how do models work? Well, basically, you start with the laws of physics and you start with all the kind of things that might go into um, the, the uh, changing climate. Um, if you want to predict what's going to happen over the next few days, that's called weather forecasting. We've been forecasting the weather uh, for some many years. We know how those models work. And here are the various ingredients of the physics of the atmosphere and the oceans and the sun, which go into a weather model. Um, and then you formulate all this as ghastly differential equations. Um, and what we're seeing here are the Navier-Stokes equations plus a few extra bits, which are actually used by weather centers all around the world to predict tomorrow's weather. These equations work. They are tested every day and um, they are constantly improved um, as a result of those tests. So we know those work. And what you do then with climate is you add in lots of other things like the impact of carbon dioxide, ocean currents, vegetation, and so on. Um, and here's the progression of climate models from the mid 70s up to basically where we are now, um, showing um, that in the 70s, people looked at the atmosphere. Um, in the 80s, people started looking at the atmosphere, the land and the ocean. Um, and as we move now, we're now putting in much, much more um, chemistry of the oceans, chemistry of the atmospheres, um, all sorts of other things. Um, and of course, the hardest thing of all to put in is the impact of humanity and what carbon dioxide we're putting into the atmosphere and other gases. So that's what's used. Um, these are then put onto supercomputers. Again, we heard about this in the last talk. They're discretized. Um, this is very much my job is to put them onto the computer and make sure that they run and that they run accurately and they run quickly um, so that we can make predictions. Um, and this is what is then used to produce these kind of pictures that we see used by the IPCC to make predictions. So these things are super complicated, um, but just to show you how we can get quite a, a way with something quite simple, uh, I want to quickly talk about energy balance. So the energy balance models very simply say that the energy coming in from the sun, which is about 342 watts per meter squared, um, is absorbed by the earth in the atmosphere. Um, that's used to heat up the atmosphere. It's used to heat up the earth. And then um, the earth re-radiates that energy back into space. And by conservation of energy, energy coming in equals energy coming out. And from that, you can actually work out things like the temperature of the earth. Um, and here's basically the model. Um, you have the sun producing amount of energy S, which is 342 watts per meter squared. Um, the Earth essentially acts as a black body, radiating that energy back into space. And the amount it goes back into space is proportional to the fourth power of the temperature times a number which is called the Stefan Boltzmann constant, which is constant. And E, which is called the emissivity, which reflects the, um, is related to the transparency of the atmosphere. And the more transparent the atmosphere, the more energy goes into space. The less transparent the atmosphere, the less energy goes into space, and actually the hotter the Earth gets. And the transparency is affected by greenhouse gases. Um, and if you solve that problem, it's not very hard. Um, that gives you the temperature as a function of the transparency of the atmosphere and various things. And if you put in the known values of the solar energy, the Earth's albedo, that's how well it reflects light and the amount uh, that gets through the atmosphere, you get that the Earth's average temperature is 288K, which is dead on right. So these models are very useful, and we can use them to make predictions because as more um, carbon dioxide goes into the atmosphere, so the um, temperature, so the uh, emissivity, the, the, the amount of um, radiation that goes into space is reduced. As E goes, gets smaller, so the temperature gets larger, and that's why we're seeing temperature rise. Um, so we know that the carbon dioxide is going into the atmosphere. That decreases E. That then rise, raises the temperature. And we can use that very easily to work out what the temperature will be as the amount of carbon dioxide goes in. This is solid physics. You cannot deny this. And this is the primary reason that we know what's going to happen 
and why it's going to happen. It's not quite as simple as that. Um, the reason for that is that as well as temperature come, uh, energy coming out and energy coming in, there are a number of feedback loops. Uh, for example, as the Earth gets hotter, so the amount of ice starts to melt, and that means that the Earth becomes less reflective because ice reflects um, energy. Um, similarly, um, as the uh, Earth gets hotter, we get more methane coming into the atmosphere due to melting the permafrost. These are what we call climate feedback loops, um, and these uh, lead to somewhat more complicated curves. Um, so this is what we call, um, uh, well, it's, it's uh, sort of what we call tipping points, where uh, as you change things, you can get very sudden effects um, due to these feedback loops. Um, they tend to make everything much more sensitive um, and um, again, they mean that we can predict what the temperature will do as the carbon dioxide goes in, but the feedback loops actually says, imply that it's going to rise faster than the energy balance models say on their own, which is actually quite worrying. Um, just to kind of show what can be done as well, this is stuff that I'm doing. Um, I, I'm very interested in what the climate did in the past because that helps us understand what it's going into the future. Um, so this is an example of an EMIC, um, which is the what's called the PPO4 model, which is a model we use to predict ice ages. Um, and the current understanding of the ice ages is that what happens is that the ocean absorbs lots of carbon dioxide, and at a certain point it can absorb no more and releases that carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, and the sudden release into the atmosphere causes warming, and um, that leads to the end of an ice age, and then the ocean absorbs carbon dioxide again. It means we go into that, um, and this is all kind of synchronized with variations in the amount of energy we get from the sun uh, due to things called Milankovitch cycles. Um, and this scary thing here is the sort of model that we might use for that. Um, don't need to go into the details, um, but the prediction of that model is shown in the graph uh, above, and that lines up very nicely with the actual temperatures that we see in the ice ages. So we can use these sort of models to help us understand ice ages, and that helps us predict again into the future, not for tens of years, but for thousands of years. Um, just to conclude, um, climate models on their own are not much use to humanity. What we need to know is how the climate impacts on all the other aspects of our life, from agriculture to energy to health and human settlement. And these um, then become what we call Earth system models, where climate modeling feeds into various other aspects. Um, here's an example. This is one of my students. He's called Tozin Babazola from Nigeria. Um, and here's the model that he's developed to help predict the impact of climate change on agriculture in, in Nigeria. In particular, he's looking at the way that cocoa farming is impacted by climate change. Um, and one thing we're doing a lot of work on with my group at Bath is looking at the impact of climate change on our energy supply, um, how it might lead to um, changing um, failure rates, um, changing in demand, and also how energy itself impacts on the climate. So this is really important um, and is driving the, the, the change in the way we produce energy so that we try to burn less carbon dioxide. So just to conclude, um, there's lots of data showing evidence for climate change. Um, we have to be careful how we interpret this, and the best way to interpret it is to link it to a climate model, which is uh, basically a bunch of mathematics. And I would argue very strongly that mathematically based climate models are our best way of predicting the future. So if you have mathematical or statistical skills or skills in data science or computer science, these are extremely valuable as we try to understand climate change and its impact on humanity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. But please remain, um, please stay with us online as we'll have you again in a minute for the panel discussion. And a big round of applause, of applause to our distinguished speakers for their informative and um, very good presentations. And I believe all of you should have obtained new ideas from our speakers. And it's now time for you to raise questions and exchange ideas with them. 
And in this Q&A panel discussion, we welcome questions from both our online audience and our live audience. So if you have any questions for our online friends, please use the Q&A function on the live webinar platform. And for those who are sitting here, please raise your hand and our staff will pass you a microphone. And to host this panel discussion, we're very honored to have Professor Amos Tai again as our moderator. Let's welcome Professor Tai and Dr. Bonebreak to come on stage again. Let's welcome them. And now let's also welcome Professor Butt to join us on the screen again. Thank you very much, Professor Butt, and uh, thank you very much, Tim. I think uh, I have learned a lot from both of your presentations as well. And uh, I think this is a great time for all of you here in the audience or online. I'm actually seeing a lot of questions popping up online already. Yeah, so this is a time for you to maybe dwell into one of those questions more, one of those concepts more, and uh, perhaps we can also share uh, about uh, our perspectives on uh, uh, different issues as well. So first of all, maybe any questions from the audience right now? Well, maybe I can start with some, oh, well, sure, yeah. Thank you, please. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, I have a question. So the, is it the most effective way to slow down global uh, warming is to reduce carbon emission? So. How can we like reduce carbon emissions significant enough to uh, slow down the global warming without wrecking our uh, global economy? Because our economy is really depends on emitting carbon dioxide. Because our cargo ships, uh, cargo planes, uh, emits carbon dioxide, and all our factories like also emit uh, carbon dioxide. So isn't it mean we need to shut down everything to like reduce the needed amount of carbon dioxide to reduce the effects of uh, global warming. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, since I'm holding the microphone, I'll uh, first uh, maybe respond to this, and then Professor Butt and Tim can also uh, chime in. Uh, I definitely, uh, reducing carbon dioxide emission is, uh, I would think, is the most important uh, channel to do. Some other people have suggested maybe doing geoengineering, maybe shooting a lot of aerosols into the sky so that they can reflect sunlight away, or you, you, you know, using other methods. Uh, but by far, the most effective really is to reduce carbon dioxide emission. So do we have to turn like the whole economy down in order to uh, uh, reduce carbon dioxide emission? I would say no, not really, because uh, ne right now a lot of energy shift is already occurring, shifting from you know high carbon intensive uh, uh, energy supply toward more renewable energy, uh, carbon zero kind of uh, energy sources. Mm -hmm. So if those industries and the uh, uh, renewable energy can be developed and implemented on a larger scale in time, there are actually technology to do it. It's more about the economic incentive in order to provide those um, uh, uh, renewable energy. Those energy sources are renewable, they are carbon zero, and uh, if we can switch to them in time, uh, we can actually pull the uh, brick on the climate disaster. And uh, Tim or uh, Professor Bud, can you chime in? Uh, I'll, I'll kick off. So I, I completely agree with you that renewable energy is a magnificent way to go. So when I started working with the energy industry back in the 1980s, no, renewable, no energy was produced in the UK renewably. In the UK now, 30% of our energy is produced renewably. And, and that energy can also then be used to uh, change the way we use our transport. So there's been a huge increase in the number of electrical vehicles or vehicles powered by hydrogen. So all of these are not producing carbon dioxide. And the plan in the UK, I'm sorry to talk about the UK, is to basically double the amount of electricity we produce over the next uh, 50 years so that we can produce a power more electrical vehicles but at the same time to produce that electricity in a carbon zero way. So it's done uh, through renewables or by burning hydrogen or, or stuff like that. So I see these as very, very strong ways forward. Um, another way is that I'm attending your conference, but I have, uh, I'm attending by Zoom. I have not flown to your conference. And the cutting down in, in air travel by electronic um, video conferencing is actually having an effect on the amount of carbon dioxide that we put into the atmosphere by aeroplanes. So I think we can see 
very strong ways forward of reducing carbon dioxide without wrecking our economies. Well, I would just like to add, even what we do every day, as in my talk, I've also talked about, you know, not only shutting down, not, not necessarily shutting down energy, by just switching or thinking about how we eat every day, you know, uh, eat, eating less meat, for instance, or eating uh, food that is not sourced internationally, but more locally, they can already greatly reduce our personal carbon footprint, which compiled together or integrated together over the whole population can already significantly reduce uh, uh, carbon emission. So there are a lot of ways to uh, do so. All right, uh, I have a, maybe I'll have a question. Uh, well, maybe one question from the audience and then another question from, uh, from online. So I've got a question for Tim here. So, but uh, for instance, in your uh, talk, you actually show the butterflies are actually, you know, more butterflies are actually coming to Hong Kong. So that sounds like a good thing, right? So it seems like flora and fauna can be adapting to environmental changes. They are maybe expanding their range and so on and so forth. So uh, do you think most of the species somehow uh, may be able to evolve their own way in order to adapt to a uh, newer climate and maybe it's not all bad? Yeah, I, th I think for sure it's not all bad. Uh, and I think there are ways that a lot of species can respond to climate change, including moving the distributions. Adaptation is another way that uh, there's a lot of evidence that a lot of species can actually adapt to changing climates. Um, so yeah, I think there there are some positive uh, messages from those kinds of patterns that we're seeing. But I also want to emphasize, we haven't yet seen any species, butterfly species going extinct from Hong Kong because of climate change. But that's because it's really hard to actually prove a negative, right? So whether if a species is declining in population and if you don't see it for five years, you don't necessarily know if it's gone or if you just haven't seen it. Um, so it's a lot harder to detect those kinds of losses of species, whereas we're able to see the new species to Hong Kong much, much more easily. Um, so there, yes, a lot of species can, but a lot of species won't. And so we have to be conscious of the winners and the losers in climate change. Absolutely, I agree. So uh, since Professor Bud will be having, have to uh, leave soon uh, because he has to go to class, uh, maybe there's one question, final question for, for uh, Professor Bud. So you present mathematical modeling. You know, I also run mathematical models. Uh, they, you know, fancy. But then um, the, the, the largest or the biggest wild card is human behavior, right? And we cannot really predict uh, humans are just unpredictable, you know, you the current war in Ukraine, and then the energy crisis suddenly appearing, and then last year there's COVID. A lot of these factors cannot even be predicted by any mathematical equations. So how do you think your mathematical, our mathematical models, uh, such as the global climate model or integrated assessment model, can truly help us find solutions? Well, that, that's a fantastically good question. So, uh, as I said in my presentation, what, what we do is we run what we call representative climate projections. So, we make uh, various different hypotheses as to the way humans might behave. So, the, <clears throat> the simplest thing is to say, well, humans will just carry on behaving as they are, uh, or maybe even increasing, and that gives us uh, one representative climate projection which would imply that we have a temperature increase of three and a half or more degrees. Alternatively, you can run a projection where we say, well, human beings really do go renewable and stop putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Um, there's still a load in there because of fast burning of fossil fuels. But if you do that, then you, you can get another um, set of projections. So yes, we, we can't understand what human behavior will do, but what we can do is say, if you behave in this way, this is what will, will actually happen. And then that can be used then to advise uh, policymakers. But I agree, there are things which are unpredictable. So the uh, um, uh, one of the biggest thing that has happened, of course, is the Ukrainian war and the, the impact that that has had on the way we do our um, energy. And, and yes, that has affected things and COVID has affected things. But at least with the climate models, we can do what if scenarios. We can say, if this happens, then that's the consequence. Uh, and you can't do that with, uh, without a model. All right. Thank you very much. I understand that you have to go to teaching. You have to go to teach very soon. I've got, I've got about five more minutes. Oh, great, great, great. That's great. So maybe there's uh, another question from the audience. 
so good evening, professors, and um, good afternoon to you, or is it morning? <laughs> It's morning for me. Okay, good morning to you then, Professor Bud. So I have a question. So you've just mentioned that um, like using EVs during like your Q&A session with another student just then. Um, you've mentioned that using EVs is a like good way of reducing um, carbon emissions because yeah. um, it's more environmentally friendly. But however, um, the generation of EVs and electricities in general also like have carbon emissions and these happen on like a lot of daily life materials are producing um, carbon emissions due to industrial processes. So is there a way we can like um, alleviate or mitigate the effects from like industrial production of carbon emissions? Thank you. Uh, that's a, a really good question. So the way I would answer that is um, we can increasingly uh, electrify the way industry uh, Produced uses its energy. So, um, taking away, for example, the burning of oil or burning of, of, of gas uh, to heat um, industry or to run um, machinery. Um, so that that's good. Um, then we have to say, well, how do we produce that electricity in the first place? Now, I, I see it, uh, for example, in the UK. It's perfectly feasible to think that eighty percent of the electricity in the UK could be produced by renewables. Um, the reason for that is that we've got a lot of coastline and we can put out offshore wind and therefore generate electricity using wind. Um, I'm not sure what, what the same answer would be in Hong Kong, um, but certainly wind power is, is a good way to go. Um, Hong Kong, of course, is an island. You're, you're surrounded by um, the ocean and um, we're making in, uh, increasingly uh, better ways of extracting energy from the ocean itself, from, from wave power or from tidal power. So, so I, I do see this, this is a, as a good way forward. Um, we're also getting better at storing energy. So if you produce electricity, then you can store it so you can then use it later when, you, when it's needed. So it's really important that we work with the people that produce uh, electricity to do that and then at the same time, reduce the dependence on oil and gas and replace that by electricity. Um, so I'm, I'm really encouraged by the fact that electrical vehicles are suddenly taking off. Lots and lots of people are now using these and they're getting to the point where um, they're becoming, becoming, you know, almost the main cars that you buy now. And, and these are massively, massively better at reducing um, carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere. So I, I'm really quite hopeful in that area. Definitely. And uh, in terms of Hong Kong, of course, like uh, we have uh, our energy production locally, but uh, if we can also tap our sort of uh, energy source, uh, tap into the national grid, uh, where there can be significant sources of energy coming from a wind, a, a wind, solar, and also nuclear, uh, that can be a way for, uh, for instance, uh, Hong Kong as a city to reduce our uh, carbon emission as well. And a lot more people are buying, definitely uh, buying uh, electric car uh, now. And uh, in the future, that is, that can really be an important way uh, to go. Do you have anything to add? No. All right, great. And uh, any more questions? I, I actually have a lot here. And uh, uh, I, I, one more question for Professor Bud, and maybe because I, I think about it uh, quite a lot as well. So uh, back to the physical science, all right? You know, we work on physical sciences. What do you think is the most uncertain part of the Earth system that we still kind of fail to predict well, and, uh, and thus we should, as scientists, we should really look more into those areas in the models. Uh, that's a brilliant question. Um, so what's interesting is that the, the largest source of carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere comes from the oceans. And uh, the oceans are the biggest source and sink of carbon dioxide, uh, both are in the kind of surface regions and deep down into the kind of stratified regions uh, uh, near the, the ocean basin. And we really don't understand that anything like as well as we should. And it's extremely hard to make the measurements, it's extremely hard to do the modeling, and 
Um, that's why, you know, when we look at ice ages and we say we think that the oceans are so important in driving the ice ages. So we need to understand the oceans better is, is my answer to that, because they are the biggest bit of the, of the world. They absorb the most carbon dioxide. They release the most carbon dioxide. And if we understood those better, we'd understand our climate better. Thank you very much. I absolutely agree. The ocean and uh, as well, I mean, from an atmospheric science perspective, uh, related to the ocean, which emits a lot of uh, water vapor, the clouds, uh, even though uh, we all see clouds every day, but uh, the prediction and the simulation of clouds are still one of the most uncertain um, part of the it, Earth system. I completely agree. And in fact, um, my, my group at Bath is working very closely with the, the meteorological people about using machine learning and all these new ideas to predict clouds. So we're, it's a really exciting new area. And hope that some of you interested in clouds can uh, maybe think about working on this area. Yeah. All right. yeah. So thank you very right. much, Professor Bud. I must disappear to teach now. So thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure coming uh, to join you. And I have, hope you have a really great conference. All right, let's give another round of applause. Thank you so much, Professor Bud. Learn so much from you. So um, any more questions from the audience? I've got plenty, so I, uh, yes, please, Professor Tong. Well, first of all, thank, I want to thank the speakers for very enlightening uh, presentations. But uh, I, one point I want to just add, and I haven't heard too much uh, in this discussion yet, is the, uh, um, uh, the way we uh, should uh, try to conserve energy, okay? For example, uh, just one very simple example is air conditioning, okay? We all have the experience in Hong Kong that uh, when you walk into a shopping mall or even a restaurant, sometimes the air conditioning is blasting s so strongly that you feel cold inside. You need to wear uh, a blouse or, or something, right? And just by uh, being more conscientious about controlling the temperature indoor, I think uh, a lot of energy can be saved, and therefore you generate far less CO2. And uh, because once you generated CO2 to clean it up, you have to expend more energy <laughs> to clean it up. So I would encourage, uh, especially the, the, the younger generation, if they are interested in climate, in studying climate change, they also pay attention to uh, energy conservation. Okay. So that's the one I want to make. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. And actually, there are, again, thinking about some of the positive stories, uh, if you look at uh, carbon emissions per capita, Hong Kong's actually very good when it comes to energy because we're, we're, our energy, our transportation system is so efficient. Um, I'm from the U.S. where we're horribly inefficient and we drive everywhere and we get, give off lots of carbon. Um, so, that is, so that is pretty good, but we could definitely do better and air conditioning is, is a really good one. Um, and then as Amos is talking about, um, uh, food choices are huge, are hugely important. So there are definitely things that we can do sort of as individuals to reduce our CO2 emissions. And if we can do that and sort of replicate that um, systems wide, then then that'll have huge consequences for our carbon mitigation. I absolutely agree. Indeed, uh, yeah, personal choices that we do every day uh, play a very important part uh, of you know re uh, conserving energy and reducing carbon emission. Uh, not to put all of the or pull away the responsibility from consumers, uh, but a lot of the uh, uh, energy consumption in the sort of like in the general public also comes from the building. So oftentimes, of course, we can, we should, we definitely should uh, try to reduce our uh, electrical appliances use and conserve energy, switching down our uh, AC and so on and so forth. But if the buildings themselves are highly energy inefficient, or maybe if you switch on the air conditioning, a lot of heat would be lost through a very uh, inefficient kind of uh, building materials, for instance, then uh, a lot of those energy would be w w wasted indeed. So on the other hand, uh, a lot of more pressure has to also be uh, sort of be put on uh, the building industry. You know, in the future, anything that is being built in the future should consider uh, energy saving as one of the top kind of uh, priorities, uh, you know, in, in their uh, design. 
Okay, so we so we all know that um, climate change, you know, is a problem, and even if people don't know like in detail how much it affects them, it's a, they know that it's bad and it's a long term thing. So, do you think currently uh, there are enough as uh, incentives or there are better incentives for people like individually? You know, you said that if everyone played a small part of helping with climate change, then it would like the world would change for like good, right? So, but do you think there are enough incentives, or are there better incentives for individuals to help with, you know, reduce carbon emissions? Thank you. That's a very good question. I, I keep thinking about uh, Greta Thunberg, <laughs> and it does strike me that I think some of the strongest voices in the climate change movement are from, from young kids, the the youngest people in in the world. Because I think when you sort of think about the future, those so those maps, those projections out to 2100, uh, for people like me and Amos, that's not you know, uh, it's not a big part of our lives, but it will be hugely a part of your lives, right? So it's going to be more impactful. Those big climate change impacts are going to be stronger for you. Um, so I think the incentive really is uh, to make sure if you want to have a better life for you and for your kids, then these choices, then the, these things are really important. And I think a lot of it has to do with uh, culture and education, right? So, uh, I mean, Hong Kong, I, I would say, uh, on a personal sort of like, uh, in, on a personal or individual uh, perspective, uh, the incentives are not very strong. Everybody seems to be okay talking about climate change, but everybody seems to be think, seem to think is uh, like too uh, distant from them. But the honest fact is, as we have all uh, discussed, uh, the impacts are already occurring. Hong Kong in a, is in a sense a little bit blessed because the impacts of, uh, of climate change on Hong Kong has not been that huge. But you know, climate change has already caused like great wildfires, destroying homes and uh, causing flooding you know, uh, to, to occur in many other places. And those people are already feeling it. They very, they very much has a strong incentive. For a very blessed place like Hong Kong where the impact of climate change has not been too uh, strong yet, I think one of the things to think about is like it will just get worse in the future. And when you're thinking about your future, uh, it that definitely concerns you. But at the same time, I very much feel like it's a, it's a culture. Uh, a lot of countries, they, they, it's starting in their education very young. They have already been internalizing the importance, the urgency of climate change and what they can do as individuals. Uh, I think this is definitely something, uh, you know, Hong Kong schools, teachers uh, can help instill uh, in the general population such that everybody would have, you know, peer pressure, for instance, uh, to influence each other. Yeah, that definitely has been happening in uh, many countries across the world already. All right. So I think uh, it's almost uh, time now. And again, uh, both of us and Professor Bud, thank you all very much thank you. for your questions. Thank you very much, our distinguished speakers. Thank you very much, Dr. Bonebreak. And would Professor Tai please remain on the stage as we'd like to invite you to say a few words as a roundup to the trending topic section on climate emergency, please. I'm here just to have a few concluding remarks. I myself have learned so much from Tim and Professor Bud today. And just to recap, um, we are facing this climate crisis and the causes uh, is really greenhouse gas emission. And you can see is the energy. We have discussed a lot about energy, and but it's also a lot about the food. You can see agriculture is you know at least about uh, one 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 fifth uh, to a third of the uh, emissions. So. By identifying exactly where the greenhouse emissions are from, we can indeed think about strategically where to uh, solve the problem, where to help with the problem. And uh, at the same time, we know that historically speaking, is the uh, developed countries like uh, in North America, like those in North America and Europe that have been putting out the greatest amounts of CO2 in the atmosphere. And those CO because CO2 has a long lifetime in the atmosphere. They stay in the atmosphere for a few decades. So what they have historically um, emitted are still having an effect on climate. So we have to integrate the effect of each uh, ton of emission over time. So you can see is the developed countries that have, and also what right now China is quickly catching up right, in terms of its uh, greenhouse emission. Uh, they are causing the problem. But 
a lot of studies have already shown that, and you are already seeing this, uh, seeing uh, many observations that even though CO2 emission per, per capita is the greatest in the developed countries, all right, like these countries there, but the vulnerability to climate change is the greatest in the historically poor or presently poor countries. You can really see. These regions, they are geographically kind of, uh, I would say, cursed because they uh, already suffer from a lot of uh, stress, um, like uh, drought, uh, intermittent drought, flooding, uh, fires, and so on and so forth. And these region, because, and also compounded by socioeconomic factors, because these places or these countries are poor to begin with, they would have less resources to mitigate or to adapt to climate change, even for the same amount of uh, impact. Right, a richer country have many ways, like like Hong Kong. Hong Kong, I have a pretty blessed in a way that, for instance, when uh, the typhoons uh, Mankut uh, hit, our we, we we haven't lost any lives, right? We have very good sewage system to help with you know uh, uh, taking away the stor uh, storm water so and so forth. Yeah, but a lot of places, a lot of other richer. Uh, cities and regions, they do not have the infrastructure and resources and money to deal with disasters and clim uh, other climate uh, catastrophes. So these regions will only have more impact and more vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, even though most of the effects are caused by the richer countries. That's why during the COP27 this week and next week, a major theme is climate reparation. We are talking about, th these countries are talking about how the rich countries, richer countries, should, you know, uh, uh, designate money funding to help the poor country to deal with climate change, a problem that they didn't cause. So, yeah, for instance, this is uh, a few, uh, a few, uh, uh, cops ago in uh, 2000 and, uh, in 2013. It's very interesting because you see, who is this guy? This guy is the representative from the Philippines. Exactly just a few days before he attended this COP19 in Warsaw, Typhoon Haiyan approached Philippines, basically uh, bringing uh, down a few uh, tens thousand people, uh, a few th th basically killing a few thousand people, a, a few tens of thousands of people. And at the, um, at the conference, he was like weeping. Uh, really urging the richer countries to, to listen. Climate change is really affecting us right now, but uh, you're still sitting in your very comfortable chairs um, discussing how to deal with it. So there are other examples. For instance, this is uh, Constance Okolet from Uganda, uh, a region that is quite uh, having more and more erratic um, uh, uh, climate and weather right now. In eastern Uganda, there are no seasons anymore. Agriculture is a gamble, which used not to be, but because of climate change, these places are already experiencing uh, tremendous changes in their weather, and then that, thus their crop production has been greatly threatened. So he, she said, but these people were enjoy these people meaning the you know people in developed countries were enjoying their life while we were suffering. I wanted to know why they were doing this to us. I wanted to know whether the people in developed countries could reduce their emissions so we could have our normal season back. And uh, this is the former president of Kiri, uh, Kiribat, uh, Kiribati. Um, this country is like a low-lying island country in the Pacific, and their land is being eroded away from sea level rise. So, um, yeah. So, so. For, for them, uh, when you are talking about you know, a few hundred, I mean, a, a one or two degrees of uh, temperature rise, you may be talking about crop production failure or you know, people dying from uh, heat waves, but it may not affect the whole population. But to them, sea level rise or just one or two degree of warming is really about the very existence of their own country. They can be totally submerged in water if sea level keep on rising. So just to conclude, climate change is an urgent issue. It's affect not only the polar bears, as Tim and I have uh, often liked to say, but also everyone on Earth. It is a security issue. As we've shown you, it affects food, water, energy security. A lot of the conflicts are indirectly related to climate change as well, as people are suffering from 
food and water shortages. And it is also a justice and poverty issue because of the uneven distribution of the cost or, or the responsibility of climate change and the burden of climate change, which fall improportionately on uh, the poorer people and countries. Uh, but not all lo uh, hope is lost here. I, I think you have uh, uh, seen all three of us uh, scientists um, have been contributing to understanding and maybe addressing climate change. We have better and better numerical models right now, as uh, Professor Bud has uh, emphasized. Now we also have a lot of data from remote sensing observations. Uh, now we also make use of uh, uh, machine learning, meaning basically AI. Um, to really integrate data with uh, current technology to do better and better projections, and also to use these modeling framework and observational framework uh, to understand um, if we do this uh, versus uh, that, what will happen? And thus, this can help us devise the best uh, uh, so solutions to deal with climate change. So this is, uh, if you're interested in science and technology, you have a lot to contribute to these uh, areas. So um, I'm not going to belabor on this. Uh, again, as I've emphasized, uh, each of us can have um, uh, personal contribution by adjusting our diet, by adjusting our energy consumption, as Professor Tong has mentioned. Um, yeah, but I'm sure there are a lot of tips for you uh, here and there. If you go online, you can find a lot of tips. Uh, my message is, it, is that those tips are generally scientifically accurate. By doing those, you can really help. To conclude, we only have one Earth to live. I mean, some people may, be too very pessimistic people may say, let's move to Mars or maybe another planet. But for now, at least, and in the foreseeable uh, century to come, we only have one planet to live. So, oh, sorry. Yeah. And uh, like what uh, Wendell uh, Berry, who is a famous poet and novelist and activist, the Earth is what we all have in common. And uh, all of us only, only have one Earth to live. And uh, each of us have the responsibility uh, and hope uh, to keep it alive and uh, to sustain our future generations. All right. So that's all. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Tai. Please be seated. And thank you once again for telling. Please, please be seated. Please take your seat. And thank you once again for telling us that everybody is responsible for taking a small step in making um, and slowing down global warming and also climate change. And time flies, ladies and gentlemen. This seminar has come to an end. Once again, we'd like to express our heartfelt gratitude to our distinguished speakers for taking time to attend the seminar today. Let's give them another round of applause. <laughs>